hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program, a weekly show, which is called Things We Said Today. This is a program in which we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles, could be any part of their past, the present, maybe even the future. I'm Ken Michaels, I'm one of the four regular co-hosts of the show, also known for my syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing, being joined by my other three cohorts here. Uh, first of all, we have a uh, contributing writer for Billboard magazine and other publications, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. Also, we have our resident musicologist who writes for a lot of different publications and uh, has written several Beatle books and also writes for Beatle fan, that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. And we have the senior editor for Beatle Fan Magazine, who's been with them since the very beginning. And that is, of course, Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. On the program today, we're welcoming a frequent guest, I'm happy to say, and that is Kit O'Toole. Kit is the author of several books of interest to Beatle fans, one of which came out not too long ago called Songs We Were Singing, Guided Tours Through the Beatles' Less Known Tracks. She also recently put out a, a book on Michael Jackson, called Michael Jackson FAQ. She writes for Something Else Reviews and does a column called uh, Deep Beatles, which is an amazing column, which I recommend everyone read uh, online, in which she really goes into detail on a lot of uh, Beatles uh, recordings and gives you background information and all kinds of information about certain songs. And so we welcome Kit O'Toole to our show. Hi, Kit. I can. Wow, what an introduction. I don't know if I can live up to that, but I'll try. <laughs> Hi, gentlemen. Hello, everybody. Hi, Kit. Hi, Kit. Hi, Kit. <laughs> On the program today, uh, we're going to talk about an album which I didn't realize. I knew it was released 30 years ago, but I didn't realize it was 30 years ago this week. And that's an album from Paul McCartney called Press to Play. Um, which is known for certain songs like Press and Only Love Remains and Stranglehold. I thought before we talk about the album that Kit would give us some background about this album. Well, yeah, I think it's important to think of the sort of the context, um, the, the background of the album and, and, and the time that it was released. And, you know, think back to uh, 1984, of course, that year Paul had released Give My Regards to Broad Street, and while the soundtrack did well, and of course they scored a hit um, with No More Lonely Nights. The movie um, did not fare so well, let's put it that way. And, you know, critically and commercially, uh, a great disappointment. And I think it was a, a per, you know, he took it very personally. I mean, I think it was a, it was a, a, a blow. So uh, he decided, I think, all right, I have to rejuvenate my career. So in 85, he decided to really embrace the 80s pop scene at the time. And as we know, it was, you know, heavy drums, electronic drums, synthesizers. And he started working with Phil Ramone, uh, as well as Hugh Padgham, who was a prominent producer in the 80s, worked with Phil Collins, Peter Gabriel, Police, very hot producer at the time. And uh, they started working on material together. And the first thing that came out of these sessions was Spies Like Us, which was he was fully steeped in, in the 80s sound at this point. And he got a hit out of it, mm -hmm. you know, got a top 10 hit. So um, he thought, great, this is working. We'll continue. Now, Phil Ramone ended up dropping out of I mean, I, he did record some uh, stuff with Phil Ramone, which surface later in uh, the Ubu Jubu uh, radio shows and, and so forth, but that didn't end up on Press to Play. It was the stuff with Hugh Padgham that did. So it was released, and this was a time when it was supposed to be a big comeback for Paul. Um, if you remember, not long after it was released, I believe it was only a couple of months, uh, he performed uh, at the Prince's Trust concert uh, at Wembley. And this was a big deal. I mean, I remember this. You know, he hadn't performed live in a long time. People were thrilled to see him. They did some great, you know, great duet with Tina Turner. This was supposed to be his comeback. Mm -hmm. And it didn't quite happen. It got, the album got mixed reviews. I think some fans didn't like that he was steeping himself in the 80s sound. And so it ended up getting lost. And, and up until that time, at that point anyway, I think that was his worst selling album. 
And I think it's very telling that what was his next release after that, the following year? All the best. You know, he went back to the past, you know, went back to his hits. And by 89, of course, he did his real comeback, I mean, his real comeback with Flowers in the Dirt, which had a very different sound than Press to Play, um, a bit more Beatlesque. And it's a great album. But it didn't take quite as many risks as he, uh, as Press to Play did. So that's the background. You know, it was meant to be a comeback for him, and it ended up not working out that way. And and it was his first real dive into con- the contemporary '80s pop sound. Hmm. Now I think that the album is is actually one of his best, and I realize mm-hmm. that this is an album where Beatle fans and McCartney fans are very divided because the ones who prefer the older sound, especially the sound of McCartney in the 70s when he was producing himself for the most part, a lot of people prefer that sound as well as the Beatles sound. And here he was, like you were saying, Kit, embracing the sound of the 80s. And so I like the fact that he was experimenting here. And I wouldn't say it was overly an 80s sound because he still Mm -hmm. had... He still had Only Love Remains on there, which was, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best love songs he's ever done, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and also an acoustic song like Footprints was in there. And you did have some of the electronic drums and synthesizers on press and Talk More Talk and Pretty Little Head. But there was also Throwbacks too. However Absurd was mm-hmm. a song that was very... It was designed to be very beatle You know, he even... He even explained that, uh, you know, a lot of other artists out there were successful having a Beatles sound or tried to have it. And yet, why couldn't someone like him do it? Because he was one of the originators of that sound. So, you know, you had a mixture of all these different things, and yet uh, the public did not embrace it. So uh, why do you think that was? We'll start with you, Kit, and then ask everybody else. Well, I think... um you know, people were expecting to hear more of Tug of War, to some degree, Pipes of Peace. And, you know, Pretty Little Head was probably a bit of a shock <laughs> to people. Although, listening to it now, I mean, it's very, you know, it's sort of a Peter Gabriel-esque kind of song. It was That's him right. really, yeah, it was him really trying some more avant-garde um, stuff. And in fact, I mean, I argue, I've, I've written about Press to Play before, and I argue that this was really kind of a precursor to what he'd do as, as the fireman, you mm-hmm. know, that he ended up releasing, you know, more of his risky stuff under that moniker, um, and, you know, which protected him a little bit. Um, and so I, I think it was just, look at the reaction he got when he collaborated with Kanye West and Rihanna. I mean, mm-hmm. that boy did that divide fans. So I think it was similar to what was going on with Press to Play. He was embracing this new sound. People were not expecting this, I don't think. Maybe, you know, people thought um, uh, Spies Like Us was kind of a one-off thing because it was a movie soundtrack. And so I think it alienated um, some fans that just wanted to hear the Beatlesque stuff. Right. Because it was going to be those fans that want more of the same. Right. So... How about you, um, Al? Why don't you give us your opinion of the album? I, I was listening to it this afternoon for the first time in quite a while. And sort of what Kit was saying is, I mean, this is this is really an 80s album. I mean, listen, there's probably five tracks on here where it's almost as if the person singing those songs shouldn't be Paul McCartney, but should be Phil Collins. Mm. You know, that's how much the production is, you know, very reminiscent of that. Uh, well, not even reminiscent, you know, because it was recorded right in the middle of the 80s. But it's it's definitely in that, definitely in the, in that, in that playbook, if you want to call it that. And yet it is kind of a, schiz- a schizophrenic album in that there are, There is Only Love Remains, which to me is one of the five best songs the man has ever written. Hmm. And he's written a lot of good songs. Um, And uh, uh, Press is, uh, you know, was a, you know, very accessible single. Actually, I liked Press a lot more than Spies Like Us. 
But Spies Like Us was, in fact, the last time the man has gotten a top ten hit on, you know, under his own name. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, uh, you know, that's the way <laughs> the way it goes. That's the way it goes. But uh, certainly the, as Kit was saying, the more sort of avant-garde tracks like Talk More Talk and, uh, and Pretty Little Head are uh, definitely a, uh, um, they definitely were a departure. But then you've got something like Angry, which mm. is right out of the, uh, almost very nearly the Helter Skelter uh, playbook, if you want to call it that. So, so it is very much kind of a, you know, a schizophrenic, a schizophrenic album, but overall, the sound of it is certainly very much, an, I think more so than perhaps any other album, because the the mid-70s McCartney albums, say Band on the Run, Venus and Mars, they don't really, you don't say, that's the 70s. You know, they don't have a quote-unquote 70s sound, if, if indeed there is one 70s sound, which mm-hmm. there really isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think this is, Maybe maybe the only solo album, the only post Beatles album, uh, post Beatles McCartney album, that is sort of of its time. Let's put it that way. <clears throat> See, I don't really understand that. What what problem do you have with the eighty sound in particular? And then uh, it's, not so much, it's, not, it's, it's not so much a problem as, but that's I mean that's just the way. I, you know, when I listened to, when I, as I said, when I listened to it this afternoon, when I heard Stranglehold, which is the first uh, track on the album, mm-hmm. uh, I thought, huh, that should be Phil Collins singing that because the production is so much, you know, it's so reminiscent of his, of his hits. And, and that, you know, that very heavy, as Kit was saying, that very heavy electronic drums, heavy synthesizer sound. You know, I'm not particularly knocking it, but it is certainly reminiscent of that of that particular time. But just because other artists had success with that sound, why do you think Paul didn't fit with that sound? Uh, because because he's never because I think again, I think the album was too for his safe for his his hardcore constituency, if you will. I think I think the album was a little too schizophrenic, you know. Not only do you have that '80s sound, but also, you know, hey, let's face it, people don't really, you know, a lot of his hardcore fandom doesn't like the Fireman albums. You know, they probably maybe the third one was a little bit more accessible, accessible, but certainly the first two are. You know, ambient dance music, which, you know, may not be one's cup of tea, especially the, you know, kind of the 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 hardcore uh, McCartney constituency. And I suspect that tracks like Talk More Talk and and Pretty Little Head probably fall into that same uh, that same area. And the (laughs) the real head scratcher that a song like Spies Like Us could be a top 10 hit and yet. Only Love Remains, which, as I just said, I think is one of the five best songs a man has ever written, didn't even reach the Hot 100 in the U.S. Mm. Yeah, I think it made the adult contemporary charts, but that yeah, was about yeah, it. Yeah, that's and, right. Yeah, but, but and, and you're it. right. I, I think it's aged much better than Spies Like Us. That's that. Yeah. I will say that. Because I will say that. Yeah, Spies Like Us is not one of my favorite Paul tracks, that's for sure. Right. So there's a. I think there was a lack of consistency to this album that they're you know the uh, that that tug of war was a much was a much more consistent album and pipes of peace as well since obviously pipes of peace and tug of war are out of the same you know the the same area of time hmm. I'm, I'm having trouble understanding when you're talking about consistency you mean consistency stylistically or are you yes. talking about in terms of the quality of the music uh, I, th- I would say stylistically because because as I said this you know uh, press to play is kind of all over the place 
musically. You know, you do have a you know a beautiful ballad like like Only Love Remains, and then you have something that's relatively avant garde like Pretty Little Head or Talk More Talk. You know, and then and then you've got also these these other tracks that as I said, are really that really more are more remindful of a Phil Collins or the Sting or somebody somebody else, um, uh, rather than something that immediately reminds you of Paul McCartney. So yeah, the one thing I'm, I just uh, you're talking about tug of war, which musically to me is all over the place. That's a very eclectic album. You've got a ballad like Somebody Who Cares. You've got a funky track like. What's that you're doing? You've got uh, symphonic, classical sounds and wanderlust. You've got um, something like Dress Me Up as a Robber, which is kind of Latinesque. You've got ballroom dancing. You know, there's so many different styles on there that to me, that's all over the place musically. That to me right. is the hallmark of who Paul McCartney is. And Press to Play to me is no different, only that it has more of an 80s sound. Yeah, uh, certainly certainly press to play is is more there's more experimental music you could say than on on this album than there than there was either on on tug of war or pipes of peace Mm -hmm. you know that certainly you know talk more talk or pretty or pretty little head would have been very out of place on on tug of war Oh, no, just again, I, I think, you know, when I was talking about the context earlier, that I think that's why it's important to think about the context, because, um, you know, I think he wanted to try something different. You know, he wanted to be a bit more experimental because he was sort of looking to jumpstart his career after Broad Street, you know. And so I think he was in a more experimental mood at that point. It's interesting that you're saying this because Paul McCartney is very often accused of being too mainstream. Here he is trying to do something experimental, and yet the public won't take to it. Um, yeah. Steve, what are your thoughts? Well, believe it or not, I actually think, taken at face value, the songs on this album are, are actually pretty good. That, I mean, they're, they're I'm, in fact, I think they're, it's probably a better than average group of songs that have some really nice hooks to them and they sound really great. The problem and the big, it's a big problem is the production stinks. It's Mm -hmm. horrible. I think it's cluttered. It's noisy. It's overactive. I mean, it, it almost hurts to listen to it now. And I think that, you know, I think that's really the, the big problem with this album. I, is it mainly on know, the experimental tracks or is it no, the whole, the entire every, album? Everything. It's the whole thing. It's and it, I, it's interesting that you that you uh, you guys brought up the comparison with Fireman. In uh, I have to look at all music the all music guide and it said he was trying to be punk, which I think that's almost laughable. <laughs> yeah, I don't I, agree with that. I don't. I don't. I don't see that at all. The Fireman comparison. A- angry. Angry is a little bit like that, though. Right. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. That's that's the closest. Yeah. yeah. That, I, I I I agree there, but. There is kind of an edge on a couple of the tracks, but I don't, I, I don't see that uh, even. I don't even see that as completely valid. Maybe a little bit, but no, no. He was. I mean, I don't know what he was trying to do with the production, but it's it really is horrible. And I think that's the that's the real down to this album. That's why this thing. That's why nobody really gives it much of a damn about this thing now. It's too bad, too, because I mean, the songs are, I think some of the songs are really good. I mean, uh, you know, press. I like Press to Play, or Press a lot. I like Only Love Remains, Pretty Little Head, Talk More Talk, and Footprints, which, which I have to admit, after uh, when I was listening to it earlier today, and I, I hadn't heard it in a long time, you know, I was going, okay, that, that's a forgettable song, but I, God, that's a great song. But again, the production the production on, on this album is really what kills it, and that's and it sounds very dated. And I think that's exactly that's, that's I the don't, problem. I don't see you know if you if you to me yes it has an eighty sound some of the songs anyway not all of them but what's the problem with that? I mean I could listen to some Beatles songs from the sixties especially the early stuff, and to me you know as much as I love it, it doesn't sound like anything that's out today. You know, it doesn't have, 
you know, a, a, a current sound, a modern sound to it, and yet I still love it just the same. Yeah, I, think, that, I think that's kind I, of his virtue. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, I think I think the uh, the eighty he could have done a better job with the eighty sound than he did. Again, it's the it's the production itself. I don't hmm. I don't I'm not criticizing the fact that he tried to be eighties with this thing. I'm criticizing the, the the fact that the production is just horrible. It really, it, it really is. It, it, it's, it's dreadful. By the way, I, I, I we should mention that the press, the, uh, for chart uh, positions, press to play the single hit 21 in America and 25 in the UK. Mm-hmm. Stranglehold, Stranglehold in the US hit 81. Only Love mm-hmm. Remains in the UK hit 34, and the album uh, hit number 30 in the US and number 8 in the UK. So it was a top 10 hit in the UK. Hmm. Um, but anyway, uh, I, yeah, I mean, that's really, that's really the problem. I don't, I don't know that I'd necessarily mind an 80s thing. I mean, David Bowie did some great 80s stuff, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. and that's a lot more listenable than this. And I think that's, uh, maybe, maybe it's, you know, saying he was outside of his element or something. I don't know. I, but that, I'm, that's just a, I'm not, I, I'm not trying to reach for a criticism there by saying that, but it's just uh, the production though is really what what hurts it the most as far as I'm concerned. Well, it might be you... it, it might be more of a reflection on you Pagum possibly because because there are a lot of people who, you know, when they hear Phil Collins hits from the 80s now, you know, in some cases want to throw up. <laughs> I, I, again, I don't know that it's 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 the '80s thing that that is what's doing it. I mean, maybe it is, but uh, from my point of view, just listening to all the, you know, all the maybe maybe it is Pat. Maybe you're right, and and you know, but I mean, it's just it just sounds way too cluttered, and I don't necessarily hear that in all '80s music. I mean, mm. so when um, you when you hear other Hugh Padham productions of the '80s, Steve like Genesis, like Phil Collins, like Peter Gabriel. Do you like the production there? Depends on who we're talking about. I'm not I'm not a big Phil Collins fan. Genesis, however, I like because that's what you expect. And maybe that had, maybe that is part of is part of it too. I mean, you didn't expect McCartney to go this route. And so But, but why? Why wouldn't you expect that? I mean, because the thing McCart- is that's not, that's not McCartney. Uh, that's not true. <laughs> I mean, no, one I, of the things I, I that, think that we... I think, it is. No. I, think, I think it definitely is, because McCartney has always been known to be a more of a um, middle-of-the-road uh, kind of ballad guy, and he really went out of his element here on the production with the production on some of these songs. And they just don't... Uh, maybe it's they don't fit the McCartney stereotype, but... Um, well, there's the problem. There's a stereotype. Well, that be that as it may, that's the hit, that's his history. That's his history. I don't think you can discount that. Uh, you know, that's what people. I mean, uh, you guys were talking about what fans expect, and I kind of mm-hmm. said that. I went, I went, no, 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 no. But maybe that, maybe that is it. I don't know. But the, like I said, the the thing that I mean, maybe if this had been produced a little better, it would hold up a little better. But for that reason, it just it just does not hold up. It's too bad too because I I do like I do think the songs some of the songs are decent. I I really do, but it's the production it just doesn't make it for me. Alan, so, let's get your take. Okay, <laughs> I'm just trying to I'm just I was trying to just make some notes because there's so many things to respond to. <laughs> I generally agree with Steve, but I, I, I think I know what he was trying to get at, but didn't quite get there. The, the production, in a lot of case, does ruin some of the songs. And I can, mm. I can use as an example, um, It's Not True. The album version of It's Not True, I can't stand. And the single version, which is a completely different kind of mix mm-hmm. um, and shows the song much more than the album one does, which buries it under the sort of electronic production. When I, I, today, okay, what I listened to today was the original album, you know, with the bonus tracks. Plus there is a set that someone 
has compiled um, <laughs> <laughs> called called the McCartney Companion, which has you know all or most of the remixes and ten inches and twelve inches and, right. and you yeah. know and, uh-huh. and B sides and you know and so going down all that you know I sort of heard it's not true and said oh my god I can't stand this if this were if this was not Paul McCartney. There is no way I would listen to this at all, okay? And then got down to the single mix and said, uh, oh, yeah, oh, that, yeah, I remember that. I mean, Mm -hmm. the single mixes that don't get compiled on albums get buried in history, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, That's a good point. It's a pity in in, in in a lot of cases, and then also some of the remixes of press have really interesting stuff going on uh, Mm -hmm. in them. In a lot of cases, uh, okay, here's what I think Steve may have been getting at when he, <laughs> when he talked about how it's not McCartney and not what you expect in McCartney. It's not that – I don't think it's that Steve necessarily or, – or I or, or you know various people necessarily expect him to adhere to the stereotype because he does mm-hmm. a lot of different things, as you say, Ken. and. Mm-hmm. Sometimes he does them successfully. In this case, I think in a lot of cases he didn't do it successfully. It was like, you know, I can listen to a Phil Collins track from that era and it works for me, but that's Phil Collins being Phil Collins in his Mm. milieu. This is Paul trying to be in Phil Collins' milieu, and I just don't get the feeling that he believes it himself. I think he, he, you know, was trying to... Uh, consciously update the sound and, you know, get mm-hmm. into this 80s thing because it was the 80s and he wanted to be current. And, you know, I totally understand a musician wanting to be current. And especially if, you know, he's had a failure like um, Broad Street, which, by the way, I didn't hate. I mean, maybe <laughs> one of the few people, but particularly the album. I mean, there's some beautiful stuff on there, but nevertheless. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's say he's trying to overcome that. It, it just seems to me, and this is something that, that McCartney does a lot of the time and is as Kit says the the Kanye thing turned a lot of people off possibly for the same reason because he seems mm-hmm. to be he seems to be chasing after something that is inferior to his own best and not succeeding at it because I just don't think just didn't feel like he believed it. It felt inauthentic to me. It felt like, you know, I'm, I'm doing the moves of an 80s thing because I'm versatile and I can do it. But it just didn't it just didn't work. And, you know, three years later, when he went on tour, you didn't hear any of that kind of stuff. It was still the 80s, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, but again, you know, like like uh, some of you have said, uh, pretty much everyone has said, <laughs> There's like a great mix of, of, of different things here when you've got Only Love Remains. I mean, if, if if you could throw away the rest of the album and if Only Love Remains was left, that would be, you know, almost worth it. Um, yep. But, you know, and there are some other nice nice tunes, nice uh, – some of the production – I mean, I kind of like the production on press itself, but – in a lot of cases, it's another problem I have with a lot of McCartney stuff. He's got the great melodies. He's got the great instrumental arrangements. And then it sounds like he spent less than three minutes writing the lyrics. I mean, Ursa Minor, <laughs> Ursa Major, for God's sake. Uh, you, know, you know, some of his best work could have been just that, too. Possibly, sometimes, but this wasn't. So, it, for me, of course, you know. But... Um, yeah, you know, so there was a lot of time and I'm just listening to the tracks and saying, you know, he's got some good stuff going here. If only he had taken more time writing lyrics that, you know, meant something, these would be better songs. And then there was the production aspect. So, so yeah, it's kind of mixed. I mean, overall, I, I uh, like Steve, I hadn't played it in a long time. And or did Al say that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. I hadn't played it in a long time, and you know, sort of. That's why also I listened to the B sides and things too, just to mm-hmm. to get a sense of the whole package. Uh, you know, uh, once upon a long ago, I don't know. I I, I, I had mixed feelings about too. There's aspects. There's aspects of that that I kind of like. Uh, there's the violin solo by Nigel Kennedy, who at the time was sort of a rising classical star, and has mm-hmm. always been kind of an iconoclastic guy you know he's got spiky hair and he's he just recently uh has been touring with his arrangements of hendrix um well that song that song had nothing to do with press to play but it's from the same era 
From the same period, yeah. I believe they used it as a right. bonus and track. And it's a, it's a, it was a bonus track, track on, the, on the, the McCartney archive, or the McCartney collection. Okay. Really That's just something to throw on there. I don't really associate it with Press to Play, but... Mm-hmm. It, it sounds very it's different. different. It's definitely yeah. different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One, one uh, other one. Uh, first of all, Alan, you know, raises a great point about the remixes, everything, because it is worth hunting some of those down. Because I, I think the remix of, uh, well, of course, uh, only love remains. There's a, an alternate mix with more sax, uh, which is uh, which is nice. I don't know if I like it better than the album version, but it's a different take. Um, the I think it's the 12 inch mm-hmm. of Angry. There are way more horns on it. Mm-hmm. Which I right. think is a uh, kind of takes it to to another level. I, I I think that's a again. I'm not saying it's better than the original, but it's another take. And also, I think it's the 12 inch remix of Pretty Little Head. There's some great bass on there. I I love. Um, and uh, and then as far as as the B sides and so forth, I always kind of like Tough on a Tightrope. Absolutely. Uh, that, that, that's a that's a very pretty song. I mean, I I think he could have maybe it needed a little more development um you know because as alan said and and i fully admit this as well that paul sometimes let's just say needs to work on his lyrics a little bit more Mm -hmm. but (laughs) i think uh i I will (laughs) to to put it nicely but uh you know but i do think that's uh that was a lovely track that that i think could have been with a little more development um could have been a a standout cut you know well i certainly think that um the lyrics in this album are are mixed, but there's some really fine ones, and we haven't even brought up uh, the fact that he was co-writing songs with Eric Stewart at yes. this time. Right. And in particular, Footprints, the lyrics of that song, really beautiful imagery in mm-hmm. that song. Um, one of my favorite lyrics, although I'm, I'm not sure if it's Paul or Eric Stewart, comes from However Absurd. There's a great line in there that I love, which goes, Everything is under the sun but nothing is for keeps. Mm-hmm. I just love that line. And, you know, the, the lyrics in Tough on a Tightrope are great. That song really is a gem, and I'm glad you yeah. brought that up, Kit. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I, I really kind of disagree with a lot of what you guys are saying, only because I like the fact that Paul does experiment from time to time, and maybe it's just the fact that his fans don't want him to do so and want him to put out more of the same. And it could very well be... And I know, Alan, you just said that Paul's trying to fit in with the 80s sound. But I do, I do generally think that he was listening to a lot of what was going on then. He used to talk about he learned about new music from his kids and what they were listening to. And I think he was a fan of Peter Gabriel. And mm-hmm. I think that it shows in this music. I don't think that uh, it doesn't fit him. I think it fits him very well. You know, it's just that a lot of his fans didn't want to adapt to the 80s style. And um, well, I was going to say, I mean, experimenting is fine if the experiment works. In this case, the experiment didn't work for for, you know, whatever reason. I mean, I, I still hold that the production is really faulty. It could have it could have worked. The songs, the songs were, you know, it's not that the songs were bad that this doesn't work. And I, 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 I mean, I don't know if anybody feels really, really badly about the songs. I mean, I, uh, I'm the first one to say when his songs, you know, aren't up to snuff. And in this case, that's not the case. Well, well Ken the, just mentioned uh, the lyrics to However Absurd. Hmm. And yet the song is, the, those lyrics are almost obscured by this sort of phasey mm-hmm. vocal, st- vocal mm-hmm. production that that you know well, was put was, on his on his voice. But he was going for a '60s sound with that song. Not a '60s sound. Sure, it oh, sounds like the '60s. It sounds like a Beatles song to me. Hmm. Don't you well, think so? Kid? Maybe no. Maybe what he should do, when especially since he sort of did this with parts of you know tug of war, is when he gets to the. Um, boxed set version of this if if he does he should sit down with it and completely remix it using thinking of the songs and not of it being in the 80s and give mm. us what he would do now with the, <laughs> the i i yes. think that's a great i think that's a great idea I, I, I do it's really like not you're putting down the instead, 80s in general 
yeah, yeah, the eighties was 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 the nadir of Western Civ. <laughs> so <laughs> now, now wait a minute. You've you've got an eighties kid here, so hang on. <laughs> I'm I'm, well, I'm watch like, out, watch out. But <laughs> my condolences. But you know, you can tell that. <laughs> You can tell that simply by putting on any movies from the eighty, any movies from the eighties, and as soon as the soundtrack comes on, you just go, "Oh my god!" <laughs> Awful synth sound they uh-huh. used and the cheesy saxes. And, uh. Yeah, I'm sorry. And the, 80s. And, the co- and the costumes too. The costumes are horrible. Yeah, <laughs> but we're we're focusing on the music here, guys. And every <laughs> single decade has great music and not so great music. And a lot of the music from the 80s that I kind of resisted then, I like a lot more now. And, you know, I don't just hear the songs and say, wow, that's the 80s. Just like when I hear She Loves You, I don't say, that's 1963. You know, I don't just think of the year. I just think of whether or not I enjoy the whole experience of the song. Not except just the year that, or the decade. Except, except I, that She Loves You doesn't scream 1963. Stranglehold screams 1986. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but what's All wrong right. with that anyway? What's wrong with, you know, thinking of a song and tying it to a year? As, as much as I resent that. Just, being timeless. Yeah, that's the thing, that, that his, his work, most of Paul's work is indeed, as Alan just said, timeless. This is not timeless. This is mm. of a time. I should sorry. I, I should hesitate to add that my remix idea was like not instead of the '86 album, but as a, as an alternate addition to the box set. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I yeah, think that'd be you, interesting. You're feeling this yeah. way because you don't like the '80s. Well, you know, there is a lot of '80s music I do like, but uh, I don't like a lot of the '80s music in general. I don't like the I don't like the production styles, as Steve pointed out, and although as, as Steve also pointed out, there is some great stuff that does work, you know, Bowie and Gabriel and, and mm-hmm. various, but for Paul, it doesn't. And, and I don't know, I just feel like it's, you know, when you see someone that is hankering after what everybody else at the time is doing, when that person has his own style, and even though that style is incredibly varied, it, mm. it just, it just doesn't feel good. You know, it, it feels like, you know, wait a minute, you have something to offer why are you trying to offer what someone else is offering that but you don't do as well? at the same time, if you keep putting out the same stuff, people will get bored with it. So what's wrong with trying to um, experiment more and feel what's going on in the music scene at that time and reflect that? The Beatles were doing that in the 60s. Right, it didn't work, did it? Well, to you... To you, this didn't work. Well, it works. It works well, on many levels for well, me. Well, well, for you're, you're the one talking about the charts and what the fans wanted and all that. I mean, I don't care about charts. Well, I that's mean, what if, I'm trying to understand. Why is it the fans won't accept when Paul is experimenting? Well, for instance, three years, as Alan pointed out, three years later, he does "Flowers in the Dirt," and in fact, he has never performed a single note from. This album in concert. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that, um, that doesn't necessarily and, mean anything. You know, Flowers me, in the Dirt, Flowers in the Dirt, by the way, was a gold album, as was mm-hmm. Press to Play. It's not like right. Flowers in the Dirt exploded on the charts. And in fact, he went and toured for Flowers in the Dirt, and it didn't help the album all that much, as much right. as it's my favorite album from him. And I will defend Flowers in the Dirt to a T. I love Flowers in the Dirt. But it's not like all of a sudden everybody embraced Paul because he has flowers in the dirt. He happened to have toured at that time, and it was the first time in a long time that he toured. So he was back in the limelight, and flowers in the dirt benefited somewhat from it. Well, I didn't, I know I was going to bring up I was going to bring up something else. Go ahead and finish what you were going to say, and then I'll uh, just that you know that the uh, that yes he toured behind flowers in the dirt, but given that. Press to Play was the album, the album of new material that immediately preceded it. He didn't go back to that for even a note. Well, I don't and, know if I carry too you know, much weight to that. You know, at all. plus the plus the fact that stylistically, Flowers in the Dirt was a, you know was a very different, a, di- a very different experience mm-hmm. than uh, than Press to Play. Well, well, and I think it was you know accepted more because. And and by the way, I love Flowers in the Dirt too. But you know, My Brave Face, which was of course that's a great that was a great single. 
mm-hmm. uh, you know, terrific song. But it was pretty, it was more in, in Paul's wheelhouse. I mean, it did sound more like, you know, kind of a somewhat Beatlesque kind of uh, sound. And I think his fans, and as I said, I'm not putting anybody down because it was a great song. But I think they were kind of like, okay, Paul's back now. You know, <laughs> he's, mm-hmm. he's 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 away from that 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 weird stuff, and this is this is what we want, and you know, and again, I think that's why he then started recording under the Fireman uh, moniker because he was able to then do stuff like pre will head and and talk more talk and and you know along those lines mm-hmm. uh and people would would be okay with it because it was it wasn't Paul it was the fireman you know and and so it's uh yeah i mean it's you know i i gave i gave him give him credit for experimenting i mean i'm kind of like that you know with elvis costello now elvis costello has never done a super poppy uh, album, although uh, when he did mm. the, only, the only flame in town, that was pretty. Fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I give him credit for for trying different styles. Did all of them work equally? No, they did not. But I, I gave him credit for not just having the same sound on every album that he wanted to try some country, some R and B, um, some classical, so on. You know. And so I, I really admire artists who do things like that. And so I think that's one of the reason why reasons why I've always liked Press to Play. That I, I think it's it's yes, it's a bit weirder for him, um, but I give him credit for taking that risk. Yeah. Let me, How do let, you feel? Let me just ask Kit a question. When you hear when you hear Talk More Talk and Pretty Little Head, do you think mm-hmm. that Paul fit in well with that style? Well, you know, I, I was thinking about that because I'm listening to him again um, today. Because I listen, to be honest, I listen to Pre Will Head more than Talk More Talk. I've, okay. I've always liked Pre Will Head. Pre Will Head, I mean, I was just amazed. I just thought, wow, this is really in the Peter Gabriel kind of sound, which I I don't know why I hadn't picked up on that before. We were talking um, about that on my show. <laughs> yeah. Well, you and I yeah. were talking about Peter Gabriel. Oh, that's Gabriel right. With, I thought though, with, there was some other yeah. time. that I, Okay, so I had it subconsciously in my mind. Uh-huh. But really, I mean, it does have that Peter Gabriel sound. And um, and so I'm sorry, what was your question? <laughs> I was you, going off on that tangent. Do you think that Paul fit in well with that style? I think he did. Um, I think it was just people didn't want him to go there because that's, you know, that's not Paul McCartney. You know, that's that's, you know, only love remains that. And I and I love that song. Um, But that's more Paul McCartney, you know, and Mm -hmm. I as I said, I I think it was I think he fit in with that time. And and I've as I said, I've always thought it was a, a great uh, experiment um, lyrically and structurally. I just, uh, you know, yeah, this wasn't Paul McCartney, but the the one we all knew. But I, I think, I, as I said, I give him credit for trying it and and for trying to fit into the sort of the landscape of of that time. Yeah. Well, this is the one thing that I'm going to close with here because this is what baffles me most of all about this whole scenario about not liking when Paul experiments because the Beatles were all about that. The Beatles mm-hmm. were going through changes all the time in the 60s. They not only mirrored the changes that were going on, they were the agents of change. They borrowed from so many influences, as we all know. And yet when Paul tried to step out of doing what we expect from him, not only with this, but even getting into dance music, you mm-hmm. know, whether you call it disco or whether, you know, Lawrence Juber said Goodnight Tonight is not disco. Some people think it's yeah. disco. And yet yeah. there are some fans who just don't want him to do anything different other than what they consider to be what he's comfortable with, the ballads and the rockers that we're used to hearing from the Beatle days and, and, uh, and the Wings period. Here was a time when he not only was experimenting, but it marked a big change in his career because he was going to a lot of different producers after this. You know, he wasn't going back to his producing his own albums. And there's a big change right there because I think the producers that he's worked with have had a big influence on his albums. Yeah, but I don't I really... think necessarily because you experiment, you know, it, it's going to work. And, and, and that... I mean, you, that's the whole idea of experimentation. You you try things. Uh-huh. And that just because just because you try them doesn't mean you succeed. And 
so that I mean, yeah, whatever. the Beatles. The Beatles experimented, and what they came out with was better than what everybody else was doing. And right. yeah. in this case, it's not better than what everybody else is doing. Let me let me just bring up a point. I was just rummaging around um, uh, with my the books that are near my desk, and I happened to find. Uh, Rolling Stone interviews from the 1980s, uh, where Paul talks to Kurt Loder in 1986, and to, and among they talk mostly about the Beatles in the interview, but he does talk about Press to Play at two points in the interview, in, including the very beginning, where Loder says, "On your new album, there's a, an almost punkish song called Angry. That's not an attitude usually associated with Paul McCartney. What are you angry about?" And McCartney says, well, the same things a lot of us are angry about. In other words, he basically, he says, yeah, that, the, the, what, what I said earlier about the punk thing that, that I didn't think made sense, he said it right there. Mm -hmm. And then he, he, he goes into a little more, because Loader says traffic jams, stuff like that. And he says, well, there's that, the day-to-day piss-offs. But I was thinking more about um, British trade unions withdrawing coal where there's old ladies dying and we just kind of let, we just kind of go, yeah, well, the union's got it right. And Britain's attitude toward apartheid at the moment, which is just so crazy. I'm not going to read the whole thing because there, there's a little more than that. But basically, he got into a, you know, uh, he was, he was trying it looks like he was trying to embrace the whole, the whole sex pistols political thing which is kind of weird in itself and then he also uh loader later in the interview asked him critics may be pleased by the harder pop sound of press to play some of the tracks have an almost experimental tilt to them and he says the funny thing is that there was a time when i was the avant-garde one in the beatles around the time of sergeant pepper because that album was largely uh -huh. my influence and again i'm not going to read the whole thing but he equates that with the avant-garde situation, and that I think that's kind of I, I'm not sure I agree with that, but it's an interesting point that he brings up. Anyway, I just wanted to, to bring those points up because we kind of, we kind of looked at that earlier and we said no, but apparently that's what he was thinking. So well, and that, and that's interesting that you bring it up, Steve, because I remember the following year after the press, you know, after press to play didn't perform, you know, commercially, he did an interview with um, a magazine I miss very much, Musician, and mm. um, that was a great, great magazine, and he was on the cover and he was promoting all the best, and I think the the headline was even McCartney gets angry or something like that. And he really, that was one of the angrier interviews that I've seen him do. And he was returning to the theme of, you know, everybody thinks that John was the avant-garde one, but I was doing it first. And, you know, he was going into all that again and was saying that he felt that since John's death, he had been sort of sainted and that, you know, and I mean, he just really gave a pretty candid interview and he was definitely in an angry period. Uh, mm -hmm. Right there, and I think part of it may have been the the, the commercial disappointment of of uh, press to play. So mm -hmm. you know, well, so yeah, I think maybe for a couple of years he was sort of in that space. You know. There's the aftermath of John's death, and right. everybody saying that he was the genius and noticing his contributions more so than Paul and the others, and I think that really got to him. So it's a combination yeah. of that, but at the same time, I think Paul was so used to having success. That when yeah. you have an album like this and it doesn't perform the way that he expected it to, then in the back of his mind he's thinking, well, I should be doing something else, or maybe it wasn't my best work. He, t he has a tendency to look at the charts and then judge whether or not, whether or not the, the music is good or not. But there's so many factors as to why certain records sell and why they don't sell. And he mm -hmm. doesn't really realize that. He's just the artist. It was a top ten in the UK. Remember? Right. But so, maybe he was thinking about the U.S. or worldwide. It didn't get the reception mm -hmm. overall that it should have gotten. But your comment, Al, about Paul not playing anything from that album live, I remember mm -hmm. when Back to the Egg came out and he started the U.K. tour and he did songs from that. When he mm -hmm. returned and performed again, he would never do anything from there. The only thing he ever did from, from Tug of War was Ebony and Ivory. Uh, you know, such a, you know... A, a great album as Tug of War. It's not like he was embracing that album at all. And I don't think he did anything from Pipes of Peace live ever. No. You know? Or give no. my regards to Broad Street for that matter. No. He never did Spies Like Us live. So no. it's like there's a whole period there of songs that he's never performed live. So to pick, you know, Press to Play in particular and say, well, 
he probably didn't think that was a good album because he didn't perform it live. I think he just takes a look at the success or lack thereof and judges from there. Or he will play whatever the new album is when he's touring and that's it. Mm-hmm. So, mm. But I just think it's, it's kind of a sad thing in a way because Paul, I believe, is kind of trapped. Because when he wants to do something that's, that's experimental, a lot of fans will not take to it. They want the same thing that they've, they've been expecting all along. And then if he does that, then he's not growing enough as an artist. You know, to me, just being as musically eclectic as Paul is, that alone is being experimental. And, you know, but there are a lot of people who just want more of the same and don't want to embrace when he tries to do anything different. It's funny. I, I have a different idea of experimental than apparently everybody else here. For me, something is experimental when it is heading off into left field, doing something other people aren't doing um, because you have an idea and you want to explore it. The fireman stuff is experimental. And a lot of people, you know, people I think generally, even if a lot of the fans didn't go crazy about it, I think it's generally respected in a way that a lot of the stuff on Press to Play isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, with the stuff on Press to Play, I, say, I don't hear these as experimental because to me it sounds more like I'm hankering after what other people are doing, not I have an experimental idea that I want to go try out. I like that. That's a good mm-hmm. point. I guess it also depends on, you know, I don't mean to, to get picky or anything, but, you know, maybe we're thinking of experimental in this case in terms of it's experimental for Paul McCartney, mm-hmm. you know, that it's, I mean, that he's, yes, I mean, he's definitely not breaking new ground, you know, I mean, that, I will say that. Uh, I agree with that. But I think, you know, for him to, to break out of his typical sound, for him, pre little head, talk more talk, it is pretty experimental, but but again, kind of judging it based on his other work. You know, there's a, just another way to think of experimental, maybe. Yeah. Okay. But there mm-hmm. are examples, to me, certainly, of experimental, like mm-hmm. Rena Crory. Okay? Mm-hmm. You take a track like that. That was something that Paul had never done or released before. You know, I don't think people look at that and say, wow, that's a fascinating recording. I happen to like it because it's so different, you know, mm-hmm. or something like Loop first Indian on the moon which is a pretty weird track and actually you talk about experimental the song hang glide which mm-hmm. is one of those i love love that track that um, is cool. to me yeah it doesn't sound like anything paul's ever done before and it has a real new age feel to it mm-hmm. so you know here's a, here's a case of and and i love examples of when an artist would put out something and to an audience if you were to play pretty little head to an audience that's heard Paul McCartney before but didn't hear that song before, they wouldn't think it's him. Mm-hmm. And obviously, Hang Glide being an instrumental, people wouldn't know it, but you know, it's, it's, um, it's definitely different for something, yeah. you know, for what Paul has done. And I think, you know, he tried, he tried to reach out and do something, you know, out of what people expect of him. But anyway, mm-hmm. are we done talking about Press to Play? <laughs> I think we pretty well run the, run the gamut. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, all, right. all I can say, all I can say is that probably if you hear somebody at the next Paul concert screaming, uh, "Play, uh, dress me up as a robber, or stranglehold," that'd probably be me. So you know, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that nerd. <laughs> I'd be saying hang glide. <laughs> yeah, well, that too, absolutely. <laughs> uh huh. All right, uh, we have another anniversary to take note of here. And actually, we're recording this on August the 29th. So we are noti- noting the uh, very last concert that the Beatles performed, and that was at Candlestick Park. And so what would you guys like to say about their last show? Let's start. Well, we'll start with Kit. Well, I mean, really, this this was such a, a, a significant moment. I mean, obviously, uh, the, the, the last you know, last time they performed in front of a, of a crowd like that. What I think is interesting, though, is somebody posted, maybe, Steve, it was you, um, you posted a photo on Facebook uh, today, and I, I think it was several photos, and one of them was John taking a selfie. Oh, the selfie, yeah. No, that wasn't that was me. That was somebody else, but oh, I, saw, okay. I saw the photo. Okay. I, I really, you know, I when I saw that today, I just thought, 
that that was such an interesting moment because here, you know, we've heard over and over, of course, about why they decided to stop touring. That you know, the strain was too much. They couldn't hear themselves. They were war- they were exhausted. You know, they wanted to focus on the studio. We we all know that. But to see that moment of of John taking the selfie, you know, there they I think there was still some you know perhaps some some sadness surrounding that show for them that mm-hmm. that in some ways i guess they were excited to move on to the next thing and and you know it became sort of beatles the you know 2.0 after that but i think there there it, it just to me it it lifted the curtain a little bit and it just showed that you know maybe it wasn't as as easy a decision as previous reports have made it where they all just said yeah screw this we're done let's get out you know i think john taking that picture you know, revealed that there was great personal meaning at that concert, you know, that there was such, there was some emotional significance for them. And I, I just, that, that picture just really struck me today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Plus, plus Paul asking Tony Barrow to record the show. Exactly. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and we're lucky he did. I mean, we <laughs> wish he had yeah. a, a, a C90 cassette for God's sake, but <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And just the mere fact of them bringing cameras on stage, which they normally, you know, had not done. You know, mm-hmm. obviously they knew that this was going to be, if not the last time, I don't, I don't think they thought of it as the last time that they would ever play a concert. But I think they knew that it was the last time that they would play this type of concert. Mm-hmm. You know that they they were thinking maybe they might wait a wait a year or two and then which as the Stones did, and then come back with the audience older and more cooled out and you know more receptive to actually listening to the music. Unfortunately, they never you know events uh, the way things panned out. They never got to that point of of being ready to go back out as a either as a touring band or as just as a concertizing act Mm. you know so it's so so i think they they knew that this was the end of at least one phase of their career and it's interesting when you when you listen to the tape that uh, alan just uh, referenced that you know, people. Uh, you know, people have made a big deal of the fact that oh, they didn't work. They didn't do anything from Revolver on that tour, and yet it's not like they were doing "She Loves You" and "I Want to Hold Your Hand" and "Can't Buy Me Love." They had stopped doing those songs a good couple of years before. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they were. You know, if you look at the other than obviously "I Want to Be Your Man," which had kind of which <laughs> had replaced boys as Ringo's uh, uh, Ringo's slot and the fact that they played Long Tall Sally at the end of that last concert for old time's sake but the rest of the set it's mainly from either from Rubber Soul or singles surrounding that particular time plus a few th- a couple of things from uh uh from Beatles for Sale Beatles 65 however whatever, however you want to put it mm-hmm. but they weren't doing you know they weren't going all the way back to their early hits they were they were doing things that were relatively contemporary even if they weren't trying to do you know the, the impossible and do songs from Revolver in that type of ridiculous concert atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Well, they still well, opened the show with rock and roll music, right? Well, yeah. Well, that's what I mean. That, I mean that came from you know from Beatles '65, Beatles for Sale, and also did Babies in Black. In fact, it's interesting how many album cuts mm. are in that are in that set list. You know, yeah. There's you know there's a few a few of the the recent hits, but there there are several album cuts that you wouldn't imagine. You know, another band of that era you know doing live you know that they would be concentrating more on just playing the hits that kind of thing yeah Mm -hmm. it's interesting that they did if i needed someone yeah um and also and and even nowhere man because i don't know even though it was a single here i don't know if the beatles thought of it you know as the hit or maybe did they perform it here only for that reason they probably thought no. of it as an album cut. Well, they, no, they did it in Japan. In Germany, yeah, in Europe. right. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was a really lousy song to do live. I mean, it was, I wouldn't call it, whoever thought of that really wasn't thinking very hard because that, I mean, it just the beginning of the song just, it just it doesn't make a great live song. So, well, well let me of course, start I a think song part that of, way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Me, part me, of, Part of that is from is the fact that they really by that point they really were not trying all that hard. You know, you can you can tell listening to songs like "If I Needed Someone" and "Nowhere Man" and "Paperback Writer" that they really were not trying to really faithfully reproduce the record. You know, they were just doing kind of like a half-hearted version because they knew nobody was listening. Yeah. Let me let me say let me say a couple of things about the anniversary. Number one, for I know Ken's been out there, um, but for mm-hmm. those who have not been to Candlestick Park, the Beatles playing that venue had to be the microcosm of what a hellhole touring was for them. Mm-hmm. Because on a on a really bad night, and you can hear McCartney on the tape say yeah. how close it is. <laughs> On a really bad night, that place is like a freezer, and I'm mm-hmm. not joking. And I'm to, and we're talking midsummer, mm-hmm. so you know. And I can imagine. I mean, when we were out there uh, for the McCartney show, it was not bad, but the stadium had changed quite a bit. That center field, the center field, uh, our the whole stadium was enclosed when mm-hmm. we when we went for the McCartney show. It was not enclosed for the Beatles show. So the right. wind came straight off the bay. And there were, I mean, I I have been in there. Uh, I attended many Giants games before they moved to AT&T Park. And I'm not kidding. Um, we, were, we would be in there at 4.30 and the wind would come off the bay and it would be freezing. It would mm-hmm. be absolutely yeah. freezing. So I can imagine what it was like for them standing up on that stage even though they were, and it was a raised stage, they were they weren't uh, right on, you know. Um, I mean, what it must have been. I mean, it must have been really, really cold. And the other thing, in the interview I did for Billboard, when I was talking with Nancy last night, we were communicating on, um, and she said I feel melancholy today. And I said why? And she said John and George are gone 50 years ago, the last Beatles concert. And I hadn't really thought about that. But she said, I bet I, I, I'm not the only one who feels that way. And I agree, and I use that at the end of the story, because I, I think she's absolutely right, that there are probably a lot of people thinking about that and thinking how much it was the end of the era. But the nice thing, and, and I, I don't mean to sound like a you know a promo guy, but I mean, the music is still with us and always will be, thank God. Um, I mean, there are it's it's with us in all sorts of interesting ways now. If you want to talk about the love show and all and and some of the other things they've done, but it's not showing any sign of leaving. And for that, you know, I guess we should be grateful. That's not true with every group in the '60s. That, oh uh, no, I mean that's that has, I mean, that's you know really I mean that's it's the reason why we're still why we're doing this 50, right. 50 years later. Right. You know, it, nobody yeah. nobody thought in those terms. You know, 50 years ago, they, uh, you know, the, everybody thought that uh, they'd be forgotten in another three or four years. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So, for that, I mean, just to bring up those two things, as far as the concert itself goes, you know, it it was typical of what they had been doing. But uh, I, I will say also too that um, I guess it was last year, I had an opportunity to tour. The dressing room where they were um, before the show, and it had not changed appreciably in the time the fifty in the forty nine years. It mm-hmm. looked very much the same, including the bat. We went into the bathrooms, and we were and and uh, my friend uh, Michael Fernet, who was with me, Michael, if you're listening, hello. He had pictures uh, on his camera that the Jim uh, uh, copies of the Jim Marshall photos, and we were comparing various sites in the in the um, in the in the dressing room and damn it looked it looked so much the same it was it was hilarious it was unbelievable Ooh. so there you go about that um, but anyway I do wonder sometimes with all the hell that the Beatles went through in 66 if they didn't have all that hell 
<laughs> if they didn't have the the Beatles being bigger than Jesus controversy, mm. if they didn't have everything going on in the Philippines and Budokan and the Ku Klux Klan and all that, and all they had to deal with was just performing, even if they were bored with performing, would they have continued the following year if they didn't have all that, you know, calamity going on? I don't they, think so. I think they would have had it anyway. I mean, yeah, how, I agree. How would, you, how would you have gotten yeah. around? I mean, as big as they were, they were the biggest entertainment phenomenon, to use the um, the old introduction, that was in music. And, and I can't see that it wouldn't have happened that way. I mean, the way the media responded and everything. I can't no, see but I'm it. saying if that didn't happen, if they didn't go through all that turmoil, do you think that they would have possibly toured the next year? I don't think they... No. Uh, no. I, I, yeah, I mean, I think at that point they'd pretty well. How could you have gotten away from the turmoil? I don't see it. Uh, I don't see how you could have back then. Well, I, I think he. I think maybe Ken means that if if the Jesus thing and the butcher cover and Japan yeah, and yeah. and Manila and all that stuff hadn't happened, would they have? decided to go on and I, I think they were probably from especially things that I've read I think they were they were already thinking in terms of of stopping touring oh, yeah. at, at yeah. uh, you know uh, at around that especially because of, you know mainly because of the fact that the music was becoming increasingly hard to reproduce on stage in that you know in the in that time frame that's why that's why i think they if they had come back to doing live performances it would have been it would have been a very different a very different atmosphere very different personnel they probably would have had other you know either an orchestra or other uh, supporting music on on the stage uh, you know, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been you know these these tiny stages in baseball stadiums or whatever. You know, it, it would not have been it would not have been what they had gone through those those previous three years. And I think, I think that and I think yeah. even by early '66 they were already thinking in in terms of of uh, of stopping the, the the touring as such. I think Beatlemania had a lot to do with it. I mean, it, just the the whole craziness. Uh, that well, of course. Well, that's what I. That's what I. You know, that's what mm-hmm. I mean. That they were. You know, that. You know, they they knew that nobody was listening to them, because of the. You know, it was all. You know, screaming girls. Even if, even if at some of the the '66 concert there wasn't as much screaming going on, there still was enough that most people couldn't really hear them. And they knew, and plus they couldn't hear themselves. They didn't have monitors, and they, you know, they really had stopped really caring about the presentation because they knew nobody could hear them. And um, so I think they just knew that it was that it was time. Plus the fact that their music was moving on in all these other directions that they couldn't repro- at that point in time they could not reproduce live. Yeah, I agree, Al. I think it was a combination. You know, I think it was that their interests had changed, you know, mm-hmm. that they yeah. that they were getting more, I hate to use the term again, but experimental in the studio. They mm-hmm. really were. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as you said, you can't, you know, how are you going to do tomorrow never knows? <laughs> I was just I mean, what I was just thinking. I mean, you can't, uh, that's for sure. Uh, or even, even she said, she said it'd be a little hard, but in any case, but, but you know uh, but, something, you know something, how far removed is Dr. Robert from paperback writer? You could probably do Dr. Similar. Robert on stage. That yeah. or Andrew Bird can sing. Yeah. That would have been that tough you because you, you got the dual guitar lines there that would have been hard to, uh, yeah. to do live. But how but do you do? The- I, I'm only sleeping. Yeah, that'd be you know, come on. Yeah. But there and, might have yeah, been a few and I just songs think as you, in. yeah, I mean, I think their interest to change. Plus, I mean, they said over and over because of all the screaming and that they couldn't hear themselves, their playing was suffering. You know, and yeah. they, I think, were very. I think they were very wise. I really do to say, look, we're you know we're getting sloppy. We're we're not caring anymore. You know, we can't let ourselves do this you know we're better than this and so they decided to you know to move on so i mean i think they definitely did the right thing 
you know. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think it was a combination of both factors. All right. So before we close, I wanted to comment on a couple of things. I got to see the Claypool Lennon Delirium in concert a few days ago. They were playing in uh, New Haven, Connecticut at College Street Music Hall. This is a, a new band of uh, Sean Lennon teaming up with Les Claypool from Primus. And back in June, they put out a brand new album called Monolith of Phobos, which you can win on my website, by the way. And the concert was, was very good. I mean, you have to... I don't know how many people will accept this music because it is very experimental and very progressive and very loose and spacey, if you like that kind of stuff. You know, progressive is definitely the word uh, to describe for their music. And uh, and Sean, I thought, both of them are just great musicians, and they were backed by three other musicians, too. And I think the performance is absolutely wonderful. It's taken me a while to get used to the new album, although I do like several of the cuts. And um, as a surprise to uh, the people who really appreciate classic progressive rock, they also perform not only songs from the new album, but... In the Court of the Crimson King, live, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and Heart of the Sunrise, part of that, the Yes song, mm-hmm. and um, and Sean sang Tomorrow Never Knows <laughs> with the band, so that was a nice treat. Uh, most of the people who came to see them were college crowd, it was right around Yale, um, there were some older Beatle fans with Beatle shirts there in the audience, and... Um, it was really a good concert. I need to really become more familiar with the album. I have liked what, I, what I've heard, but then I like a lot of Sean's stuff because musically he's all over the place too. So that was uh, you know, a fun concert from uh, the, the Claypool Lennon Delirium. Anybody want to comment on that? Were there Primus fans there? Was there a I did see some, some Primus t-shirts, but I'm not familiar with their music. So uh, I know they're, that... They're... They're yeah. very eccentric, but very good, and he's he's a heck of a bassist. I mean, he really is. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and yeah, as I said, it's very eccentric stuff. I I can't even. Isn't the theme fun. the theme music from South Park is Primus, isn't it? Yes, yes, oh, it is. Oh. Okay. Yep. Learn something so, new. So yeah, every check day. out Primus. They're very good. Okay. And mm-hmm. one other thing, I'm just going to take one minute to talk about. I was on vacation this past week, and. Um, as much as I hate the term bucket list, <laughs> one of the things I've always wanted to do with my wife is to go to the uh, Von Trapp Motor Lodge in <laughs> um, Stowe, Vermont. And um, as Steve will know, Todd Rundgren puts on these summer camps just about every single year. He's been doing this for like 10 years. And this year he held it at the Von Trapp's uh, Motor Lodge there. And so he spent about five days there hanging out with Todd which is always a cool thing. And Mm. there at the Motor Lodge, they have a lot of activities. We went on a hiking trail with Todd. We did swimming. But the most important thing, since this this is talking about the Von Trapp family, obviously you have the whole story about that family escaping Austria and the whole story behind The Sound of Music. And Todd went and directed vignettes from The Sound of Music with (laughs) the fans there. There were about 135 (laughs) of his fans, and some of them volunteered to go on stage and sing songs from The Sound of Music, and I was one of them. But, oh, wow. but, but I didn't sing. I wasn't going to do that. I didn't quite know what to expect because I knew there'd be auditions, but all I wanted to do was just be the Von Trapp's manager, Max, and just <laughs> introduce them on stage, which is what I did. And I was in costume, too. But the, the most fascinating thing about that week was not just spending time with Todd, but I got to witness him directing a musical <laughs> and yeah. giving everybody direction on what he felt should be done for each song. And it's really fascinating because it's not just the fact that this is Todd here, but a lot of these people are unprofessional. <laughs> They're not used <laughs> to performing live, and some of them are. Some of them are really good singers. We had four Marias in this musical, and they all <laughs> sang great. They were all phenomenal. So um, I had a blast doing this. But to watch Todd in action and to give direction, you know, and to see what he's like. And sometimes he can be very demanding, you know, mm-hmm. and, and not realizing that most of these fans here are doing this to have fun. And he's taking it real seriously. And uh, so I had so much fun doing this. So um, 
apart from the fact that I learned a lot about the Von Trapps <laughs> and, uh, you know, and hung out with Todd and, and, uh, and his fans. And I've done this now for several years. In fact, the time I met Steve a couple of years ago was because he had a summer camp in California, right. in Cambria. And it just That's so right. happens that when Paul played at Candlestick Park, it was a few days before the summer camp. So I tied the two together and I was able to see Paul at that concert with Steve. Right. So, cool. um, you know, this is the first time since then that uh, we spent time with Todd. So, cool. and the sound of music has the one Beatle connection, which cool. is that it's mentioned in Yellow Submarine. So, um, oh, yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. <laughs> the hills are alive. The, yeah. So, the um, sound of music. <laughs> so, that's I, what I did uh, on my summer vacation. Did you, t- did, you, did you tell him he has to start singing Open My Eyes with uh, the All-Stars? <laughs> I didn't tell him that. But, um, you know, Todd, the, the thing about Todd is, is that, and, and people who have listened to me talk about him here on this show, I admire the man so much because he is the independent, the ultimate independent artist who does what he wants mm-hmm. on his own terms, except when he's with Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> because he plays the same three songs over and over and over again. It was different in the early years with the All-Stars because he played a few album cuts of his. Mm-hmm. Um, but now it's, it's, it's always, um, I saw the light, bang the drum all day, and love is the answer. He would not do that for anybody else <laughs> other than Ringo. And he does, he does um, try to accommodate, he tries to fit his schedule around when Ringo needs him. And Ringo mm-hmm. loves this band so much that he's still on stage with Ring with uh, Ringo. So yes. um, and Todd always tours, so he's got to make sure that he can fit in that time, that concentrated time with Ringo. So, and uh, you know, being with Ringo for four or five years with this band, plus the previous All Star bands, they've gotten really close. So um, you know, they become good friends. Mm. So you're saying that's not a that, that's not a. Uh a show that they're putting on as far as the way they like each other. The, 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 uh, the, no, it's uh, for real. The camaraderie. The it's for mm. real. I mean, why else would Ringo keep the same band for four or five years? Well, what, I, what I'm saying is, I mean, they make a big point of talking about that over and over and over again on the, on the show. And, um, you know, it almost, it almost sounds a little scripted at some points, you know, when, when they, when they talk about it, but, uh, if you're, I mean, you're, what you're saying is it's not that they, they really do have a great affection for each other. I you mean definitely like, believe that. You mean like I'm going to take my coat off and drink in the crowd, <laughs> you know, which somebody else does every night. I don't, know who, you're, I don't who, know who you're that, talking about. Yeah, mm. yeah. either. Who, who are you talking about, Al? No, <laughs> it's, a sh- it's a show. You know, when you go to see... As Paul has mentioned, you go to see a Broadway show. They say the same lines in the same place every night. Mm-hmm. You know, well, it's, a sh- people, it's a show. Some people don't equate a rock and roll show with a Broadway show. Well, and, and there are there are artists out there who they they can ad lib whatever they feel like on stage. And I think that Ringo has gotten quite comfortable where mm-hmm. once in a while he'll say something off the cuff that he hasn't said in previous shows. So. Yeah. You know, and Paul can be that way too, but most of the time it does sound very, you know, scripted. But, um, <laughs> but again, I had a great time. Uh, not just because of the fact that it's Todd is also hanging out with his fans, and I've come to know them. I mean, he's got rabid fans around the world. There's one guy that flew in from Japan to see him. Wow. It's a 16-hour plane ride <laughs> for this. <laughs> You know, wow. and people from England and Scotland, and I'm sure that there are people who have done that for Paul and for Ringo. But, you know, this group of people who want to get together for these summer camps, we've become kind of close ourselves. So it's, and it's probably the only time we get to see each other. It's kind of like the Fest for Beatle fans, only mm-hmm. for Todd fans. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it was a great experience. I loved it. Cool. <laughs> nice. All right. So uh, before we go, uh, we all want to plug our own uh, sites and ways that we can that the fans can contact us. Why don't we start with you, Steve? You can get a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail dot com. Um, I have my own personal Facebook page. There's also a, a Beatles news group that I run called Beatles News and Commentary, 
where we can talk about uh, what's going on Beetle wise and uh, and trade stories and whatever and um, uh, and I'm also writing for billboard.com and access.com so in fact I just had a story today most recent was an interview with somebody who had been at the candlestick show so anyway uh, look for me uh, in both places all right Steve is all over the place so let's move on to Alan how about you Oh, probably the best way to get in touch with me is either through the regular things we said today email address, which is what things we said radio show at gmail dot com. Was that it, Steve? Yes. <laughs> um, or uh, my Facebook pages, which are either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, and uh, that's it. All right, Al. How about you? Uh, probably the easiest is through uh, either uh, Facebook, uh, Al Sussman, or Twitter, at ASUSS49, or through Beetle Fan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com. And I have in my hand, hot off the, uh, the mailbox, the, uh, the brand new issue. Of, of Beetle Fan Magazine, which has a uh, a uh, a very much expanded version of Alan's uh, piece that was in the New York Times about the uh, the 10th anniversary of, of Love. There's a a preview of the Eight Arms to uh, the uh, Eight Days a Week film with Larry Kane. Uh, Doctor O'Toole has a review of of uh, Piers uh, Hemingsman's uh, uh, book on uh, on the Beatles. Beatles Canadian releases. Uh, there's a, a big section on Revolver, and I do uh, kind of a I take a page from the Change in Times playbook and take a look at what else was happening during a uh, kind of a grim summer of of 1966 that kind of set the stage for for the tour and revolver and uh, and all and all the rest of it uh and and much more uh in the brand new issue of beetle fan magazine and um again your probably the easiest way to get it is at www.beetlefan.com uh, uh you can subscribe at the at the website all right a lot there in the magazine how mm-hmm. about you, Dr. Kid O'Toole? <laughs> well, you can uh, find me. I have a website, uh, www.kidotool.com. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, um, the imaginative um, handle Kid O'Toole. And you can also find me on Facebook. Um, and uh, occasionally, as, as many of you know, I, I do on my personal Facebook page, a uh, Facebook Live session where I talk a little bit about you know stuff i'm working on and um and if you want to ask questions or or send comments uh you can do that and i i post when i'm going to do that on my facebook page so you can also talk to me that way okay and i just want to give in a little plug here for kit because the columns that she writes for something else with deep beetles are just wonderful and in Absolutely. fact yeah. um, there was you. one that she did a couple of weeks ago for I want you she's so heavy which mm-hmm. I'm saving as a favorite <laughs> because nice. she, she goes through all these different versions the earlier versions of I want you she's so heavy with Billy Preston on there it goes through the whole evolution of that and it's just fascinating the way she pieces it all together so kudos to you oh. right there mm-hmm. thank you I appreciate that that's just one of the the articles you've written you know, I love all the stuff that she does. Also, um, for me, Ken Michaels, I have my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. I want to mention a couple things about the website because there's all this activity with um, Live at the Hollywood Bowl coming out on CD and digitally on September the 9th. Um, and the Ron Howard documentary of Eight Days a Week. And we had Chuck Gunderson as a special guest here on our show uh, not long ago and he put out a book called Some Fun Tonight back in 2013 which chronicles all the dates all the North American dates of the Beatles from 64 through 66 and he announced on our show that the publishing company Hal Leonard is now going to put it out Chuck's always put it out independently now it's coming out mass market so I'm giving away copies of Some Fun Tonight on my website through my special contest which will be starting around the time that this airs so just like I've, I've given away Kid O'Toole's books, and those contests have worked wonderfully, 
for uh, mm-hmm. songs you were singing in uh, Michael Jackson FAQ. Um, mm-hmm. This time you can win Chuck Gunnarsson some fun tonight. I also want to mention that my Beatles show, Every Little Thing, is available on a couple of sites if you want to stream it. And one of them is a German website, which is called GlobalTexanChronicles.com. And there is one show in particular that I just did recently that I'm really proud of, and it's an entire hour of Paul McCartney duets. And also um, Paul teaming up with other people vocally in trios, all in an hour, actually an hour and 15 minutes. And you can listen to that off the website. You can stream it anytime at GlobalTexanChronicles.com. Also, there's a website called Tumblr.com, and they have a page where they collected Beatles radio shows around the country. And Things We Said Today is on there, and Every Little Thing is on there. It's actually the live show of Every Little Thing, which is on WNHU in Connecticut on Wednesday nights from 9 to 11. So you can actually stream Things We Said Today and my show, Every Little Thing, on that website at Tumblr.com. And that's T-U-M-B-L-R dot com. So uh, you can check out other Beatles shows, too, right there on the site. Okay, so this has been great, talking about Press to Play and the 50th anniversary of Candlestick Park and a few other things. So on behalf of Steve Marinucci, Alan Cozen, Al Sussman, and our special guest, Dr. Kid O'Toole, this is Ken Michaels saying thanks so much for listening. And we will see you next time.